Hello, this is going to be a lecture on the muscles of facial expression. So let's go ahead and get started. What you can see here I have on the screen are a lot of pictures of different facial expressions and also a picture of somebody without any skin. So you can see what your face looks like without any skin on it. A little bit scary. Um, and let's go ahead and dive into these muscles. All right, so on this screen, um, you can see that this particular muscle right here is actually kind of a weird starting point. It's called the occipital frontalis, and it really does run from the frontal bone area, and it has one little section right here called the frontalis or the frontal belly, and then we run into a tendinous section right here all the way back to the what's known as the occipital belly or the occipitalis, and so technically this is recognized as one muscle but the um, I think your diagrams may portray it as two so it's called the occipital frontalis and it has what are known as two muscle bellies one frontal belly and one occipital belly now the action of this muscle um, really what happens is the frontal belly here helps raise the eyebrows and so maybe you're thinking, well, why do we need this occipital belly back here? But the occipital belly helps to draw the rest of the scalp backwards so that you can raise your eyebrows. So what I want you to know is that the two muscle bellies work together to draw the scalp backwards, which is the occipital belly's job, so you can raise the eyebrows, which is the frontal belly's job. Okay, so there's occipital frontalis causing you to raise your eyebrows. Next is a slide, and I'd like you to think just quickly, what do these muscles have in common? You notice there's two around the eyes down here, and then we have the one around the, the lips here, and so you're probably noticing that they're both circular. And what I want you to remember when we're going through these in the lecture is that they are both circular, and so they are going to start with the same name that references this circular shape. And... Um, then of course we're going to have to differentiate between the circular shape around the eye and the circular shape around the lips. So let's go ahead and do that. The muscle that's located around the eye, or the eyelid specifically, is known as the orbicularis oculi. Orbicularis is the part of the name that tells you that it's a circular muscle, orb being circle. Oculi is the part of the name telling you where it is. So we're going to use a different word for the one around the lips, of course. And um, this muscle actually does run in this place as well. So it runs all the way around the eye. And I'm going to add in an O here for the origin. And an I here, if I can quickly. Oh, my phone's ringing. Okay, where were we? Got it interrupted there. All right, so I've been drawing in the origin, which is here in the medial aspect of the eye, um, and then the insertion is going to be all around the eye. And so what we get, if I can make this work, is when the insertion gets pulled towards the origin in all of these places, you get a closing of the eyelid. So this particular circu circular muscle acts like a sphincter muscle that closes the eyelid. Um, so there's that. Now the one around the lips, let's see, how do I fix that? There we go. The one around the lips, it, remember we're going to start with the same word, orbicularis. <clears throat> but this time we're going to have to differentiate because it's in a different place. So we got orbicularis, oris. Oris meaning around the mouth or the oral region. And so this, we got the circular muscle again, but if I go ahead and draw in my origin, if I'm going to divide this into quadrants actually, because that's how it works. Here's the origin for the upper lip and the origin for the lower lip. This is going to look kind of goofy when we're done. And then the corners of each lip is the insertion. So I'm going to draw arrows in, draw arrows in. So what you end up getting here we go, pull these in. What you end up getting uh, is um, a puck, like your lips are puckering, or like pursing, or protruding, or however you want to say that. Um, so you get a puckering of the lip with the orbicularis oris. And this is obviously important in, you know, speech production or, um, you know, holding things with your mouth like a straw, things like that. 
so orbicularis oris around the lips, causing lip movement. Now, what I want, do want to mention before I move on is that this muscle is not attached to either the maxilla or the mandible. It's completely attached within the soft tissue of the face. And so it only moves the lips. It doesn't open the mouth or close the mouth or do anything like that. Um, only moving the lips. All right, next one, we have an interesting picture here. Notice this muscle in purple, obviously, is the one that's um, being indicated. And it's going to attach to the zygomatic bone up here, your cheekbone, the zygomatic bone. And then down at the corner of the lips, right at the edge of the orbicularis oris that we just talked about. And so what this muscle is going to do, do this before I tell you its name, is to draw the corner of the mouth or the lips, I should say, upward towards the origin, which is on the zygomatic bone insertion down here. And so what you get is a smile. Smile on your neck. <laughs> um, so this muscle is known as the zygomaticus major. So origin on the zygomatic bone, insertion skin at the corner of the lips, and we get an elevation of the corner of the lips. Now, I think my screen's getting a little cut off, but this guy is saying, oh, you're so cute, you make my zygomaticus muscle contract. Ha ha. All right, next on the list, here is a muscle known as the platysma. And you can see this part of the word platy means flat and broad, so I'm thinking that that's probably why the pl um, platypus was named the platypus, because it's got that big broad tail and that like weird duck beak thing going on that's flat and broad and it looks kind of like a squished rat but a really big one so maybe that's why so anyway here's the platysma it's a very thin muscle that acts sort of like a blanket on your neck and its origin is down at the bottom put this in here here's the origin oh, I wish I could change colors um, ooh I think I can change that ooh origin at the bottom insertion up here on the mandible and so what we're going to see is that not only does this muscle insert onto the actual mandible bone but it also inserts onto the skin of the lower face and so we get really kind of two different actions which produces a lovely face um, when you combine them so we're going to move that downward and so what you're going to get if you move the mandible downward is uh, depression of the mandible Oh, let me get rid of my tool here so I can click. There we go. Depression of the mandible. Oops, there he is. He's so lovely. And depression of the skin of the lower face, which causes a sort of a grimace that you're seeing here. So I would I would um, recommend that you try this lovely face. And when you do this, you're going to see the platysma. It's going to kind of jump off your neck right here. And you'll see all these various tendons. And it looks really quite lovely actually really gross so the platysma helps to lower the mandible which we call depressing the mandible which is really just opening your mouth and then also the corners of the lips and kind of a grimace face it does not give you the double chin like we're seeing here or it does not raise your eyebrows but you know those are incidental to this picture okay next on our list this one based on the name should be pretty obvious as to its location it's called the nasalis and if you look right here across the bridge of the nose we see that these little muscle cells are running transversely or horizontally so this part right here is going to help to compress the bridge of the nose and then the lower region which we actually can't see in this diagram they've covered it with skin helps to flare the nostrils so I, um, let's see if I can figure out how to show you this. How can I show you? Hmm. Hmm. Well, I haven't figured out how to show you. I thought I could video record myself. Uh, but anyway, the nasalis kind of compresses the nose. So think about trying to like move your nose back inward towards your face almost like a little bunny rabbit it's not squinching the nose up towards the eye because that's these guys right here which is different but it kind of pushes the nose down and then of course I think you know what flaring the nostrils means so we've got little muscles around the nostrils which actually act like dilators to open the nostril and um, give you the ability to flare the nostril 
Okay, so that's nasalis. Now this one's a really interesting one, and you see I put the pronunciation up here because everybody pronounces it wrong. It's called the buccinator. The buccinator. And this muscle is kind of in the hollow of the cheek. It's deeper than some of the other muscles, so what you might see in your diagrams is a little stringy one running across it. Um, but this one's called the buccinator. And what this one does is, and you're going to have to try this so you get the message, it allows you to compress your cheeks against your teeth. So when would you do this? Well, if you're trying to whistle, you have to obviously use orbicularis oris to protrude the lips, but you also got to kind of suck your cheeks inward. Or if you're going to suck through a straw, you have to create that suction with your mouth which sucks the cheeks inward. So people that play um, like a brass instrument, like a trumpet or something like that, will have um, generally really well developed, really well controlled buccinator muscles. Um, so here's your action, presses the cheeks towards the teeth like when you're whistling or if you're sucking air inwards. And you can go ahead and give that a try. Hopefully you are understanding what I'm talking about, the buccinator. There's my trumpet. <laughs>